Thanks everyone for coming. I'm really grateful to be gathered with all these different people from the West Coast and British Columbia and a few different locations out here on the East Coast, as well as people in different places of the world that'll be watching this recording after. Such a warm welcome and thanks for joining us. My teacher, Bill Mollison, the co-founder of Permaculture said, there is no other path for us than that of cooperative productivity and community responsibility. Take that path and it will change your life in ways you cannot yet imagine. I am so incredibly proud of the work of Ken Shaw that he's done on this permaculture path. His long career as a professor includes designing a groundbreaking program, Applied Coastal Ecology, which readies students for careers in coastal natural resource management, ecosystem restoration, environmental monitoring, and a bunch of related fields. His fully accredited permaculture design certificate program is part of a field school that includes a bus trip to many permaculture related sites around the region. Work as a food security advocate and activist includes design and management of many highly productive gardens at his home in Prince Rupert. Co-founder of Transition Prince Rupert, Ken has also been involved in tons of really interesting community projects supported by local government. Bill Mollison also said, to demonstrate life, we act. Let us see if we can act appropriately, struggle well and with dignity towards demonstrating our human function and potential to assist all living things and to make our lives worthwhile to all life. So I really believe that Ken has demonstrated extraordinary service to life. And I'm glad to give him an opportunity tonight to share a little bit about his work with permaculture these past many years while doing the People's Diploma through the Permaculture Institute, through which I'm the Diploma Program Coordinator. This presentation represents the final requirements for completion of this diploma in permaculture design, which is a significant accomplishment. So thanks everyone for coming to the live presentation or watching the recording afterwards. And uh, welcome Ken, thanks so much. Thank you, Delvin, for that, that kind intro. And, and welcome to all of you that are here today and, and will be here uh, watching the video at a, at a later time, whether you're in Japan, uh, the US, uh, Australia, or uh, the UK, uh, places that, that uh, I've heard people may be watching. So um, my background is is the harbor of Prince Rupert. And the, so Prince Rupert is on the north coast of uh, British Columbia, a short three hour ferry ride away from, from Alaska. And it's a, it's a cool and, and very wet uh, climate. Uh, also known as the traditional territory of the Shimshin, the, the First Nations people that lived, have lived here since the ice departed some 10,000 years ago and managed to live for those 10,000 years um, in harmony with the land, uh, sourcing all their food locally, something that is, would, would be a, a huge challenge today. So um, I, I titled my presentation, Transforming a Globalized World One Garden at a Time. And I uh, took this picture out my front window and I thought it was just such a, a classic juxtaposition of of a gorilla garden on the side of the street uh, with containers full of, of uh, stuff from from Japan, or sorry, Japan from China. Um, and I'm told in the story of stuff that uh, most of this will end up in a landfill six months after arriving. So what is permaculture? Um, we all have uh, different levels of understanding. And uh, when I embarked on the permaculture journey, back in uh, 2008, uh, I spent some time collecting definitions from many permaculture teachers, and then uh, came up with my own definition. And permaculture is famous for that. Uh, and it's first and foremost, a design system based on ethics, which seeks to provide for human needs by observing and replicating the patterns found in nature. And it's more than just a design system because it has profound sociological implications about how society lives as it's put into practice. And as a, a person with a, an engineering background, the, uh, the design systems part of permaculture really, really appeals to, 
to that uh, practical side of my brain. So permaculture is, is founded uh, on, on ethics, birth care, people care, and fair share. And it's the only science, having, having taught a whole range of sciences at the post-secondary uh, level at college, that actually has a foundation in ethics. I've never started out a chemistry course, a biology course, a stats course, where we begin by talking about ethics, about what we're learning and how we, how we might use it. Um, there may be a dog barking in the background. You may want to just mute, mute your mic if, if you've... Yeah, maybe um, make sure your mics are all muted, everybody out there. Yes. So, um, and hopefully there's no more, because I've missed the screen, uh, nobody in the waiting room anymore. Okay. Um, so I, I first discovered uh, permaculture in 2008. I, I went to, uh, to Great Britain uh, with a trip with my grandmother and uh, we visited some relatives, but also took the time to visit a whole number of eco villages. And I developed, I've been teaching courses in sustainability and it was some 20 years ago in teaching one of the courses and the student said to me, gosh, this, this is a real downer because one week we talk about energy, and next week we talk about food, and next week about overpopulation. It's like, well, aren't there any solutions? And uh, eco villages were one of the sort of early topics I launched on. So I, I took I took that opportunity while in in, uh, in Great Britain, the UK, with my grandmother to travel around and see a number of places. And so um, Paul Wimbush, founder of the Lamas Eco Village in Wales one of the most well-documented eco-village projects uh, around, uh, had a wealth of information, uh, meeting with him in Wales. The Centre for Alternative Technology, where there's uh, partnered with universities and a tremendous amount of technology uh, equipment and uh, systems being, being demonstrated to, to look at. Over to the Eden Project in Cornwall and not an eco village, but it's kind of like the Disneyland of plants. And they have on display some 38,000 or 40,000 and this astronomical number of plants that are, have been or are in use by, by humans for food, fodder, uh, clothing. And it's, it's the most amazing place to see, see that there and, and with different ecosystems within the, in the different domes over to Herefordshire to the Low Impact Living Initiative, which runs a whole uh, range of courses on sustainably related topics, uh, spending a couple of days there, becoming familiar with their facility. Uh, Tinker's Bubble and a, a community of people who try to use as little fossil fuels as, as absolutely possible. And I was running behind trying to get there and I was going by and go, Gosh, that's Stonehenge there on the right, and I gotta be at this place. I've got a three o'clock appointment, and so I drove by Stonehenge and saw it from a distance. And then finally, ending up at the the famous eco village of uh, Finhorn in uh, in Scotland, and uh, on this trip, uh, seeing seeing the various forms and and types of eco villages. And for those familiar with the story of Finhorn, of uh, Elaine and um, Peter Cuddy uh, founding this location here in, in the mid 60s and the, the caravan they lived in and the story of the amazing 40 pound cabbages that they grew in this garden with the help of, of uh, uh, the spirits that they were in contact with. And so it was an amazing trip, not only with the eco villages, but traveling with my 89 year old grandmother at the time. And, you know, we're, we're from the, uh, the stock of making do. And, and so we, we tented for, uh, for a number of days in this little, little pup tent uh, at 89 years old. And uh, it, was, it was an amazing trip to, to, to visit these places and, and spend that time with her. So coming back to Canada, that led me to my first permaculture design certificate in 2009, 
on Demon Island with uh, Owen Hoblutzel from the PRI of US, uh, Jesse Lemieux, uh, Canadian permaculture teacher. And it was actually astounding because as a instructor of physical geography, so much of what we talked about in permaculture was things that we already teach in school, but it, it wasn't put together in that same format. And so we sat in the machine shed using these apple crates as our desk and uh, learning about all sorts of fascinating things. And I produced in a team our first design, becoming familiar with the design process. I had to go further. So the next year I headed to uh, Australia to do the, the teacher training course with Jeff Lawton and visiting the, the Permaculture Research Institute. And Jeff is a um, very charismatic uh, figure in the permaculture movement, uh, traveled all, all over the world uh, and has taught many, many people. Now permaculture, we often think of it as designing gardens, but um, Rob Hopkins uh, in the UK, who was also a permaculture student, uh, challenged his students one year to to design permaculture at a community scale. And from that was launched the concept of transition towns, about how to do, do, do this work at a community level. And with Lee Brain in 2011, we launched Transition Prince Rupert. And just an amazing flood of ideas. And, and so we, we actually designed a course for ourselves. We had some 25 of us basically learn different topics everything from holacracy to um, uh, some, some of the, um, um, trying to think of the names, world cafes, uh, all these kinds of topics and ways of in, engaging in, in communities. And we uh, managed to get our, a little mention in Rob's uh, book, The Power of Just Doing Stuff for our kind of unique approach. And so with Transition Prince Rupert, uh, we began permaculture efforts at a community scale. So, and that turned into a lot of uh, 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 workshops, uh, the awareness raising, showing movies and garden workshops. And then uh, that still wasn't enough. So um, I traveled to Chicago uh, for the, the first uh, North American Transition Thrive Workshop with uh, Sophie Banks and Naresh uh, from, from the original founders of the transition movement in, in, the, in, in England. From there, um, you can see this is kind of a, an, only at 2013, we've got another, another 10 years to go here. Um, me in, it, Toby Hemingway, so author of Guy's Garden, so uh, he offered a permaculture course. And I, I really like Toby's approach. He's, I think, I believe he has a PhD. He uh, was a molecular uh, biologist, uh, worked in the research facility, brought a very well-grounded approach and practical application to the design of permaculture. And it was here that uh, I first met Delvin on the call here. I was in, introduced to him by uh, Leone from, uh, from Roberts Creek, me, meeting this young fellow who I'd already read about through the Permaculture Research Institute, the planetary pilgrimage where uh, a whole group of people went and studied with uh, a, whole, a whole number of famous permaculture teachers. Then Dave Jackie, the author of Edible Forest Gardens, who wrote probably like the, the textbook uh, on designing edible forest gardens, a two volume companion and a, a, incredibly well based in, in landscape ecology. Um, definitely, I, I would say the content is definitely like a fourth year university course. And, and Dave, also a permaculture teacher, uh, one of the original uh, people that uh, Mollison trained in the U.S. back in the, I guess it'd be the late 70s or early 80s. And the chance to do more designs. And so coming back and doing work, a whole series of workshops for a number of years, 
in town and kind of a, a summary of kind of the, the study leading up to that. Uh, thrown in there is another permaculture design certificate uh, with uh, Oregon State University with Andrew Millison, a very well-grounded uh, academically based uh, program. So during the diploma period, and so when the, the, I began the diploma, it, it was a period, it was kind of like when the permaculture was beginning to sort of consolidate, um, become more, more organized, and also trying to recognize the difference between someone who's just taken a two week course and, and, and people that have spent a fair bit of time developing their, their skills and capacities. And so I, I always like to think of it as sort of the, the professional practice of, of permaculture. And here's a list of, uh, of trainings and um, processes that I went through, and I've got a couple of slides on that coming up here. So Delvin and, and Luby um, taught the social permaculture course uh, in uh, Roberts Creek here back in uh, 2018, seems like a long time ago. Luby's the author of People in Permaculture, bringing in all the soft skills and uh, things that you need to know uh, beyond just gardening. And a big part of Luby's work is the design web, uh, going around the circle, uh, the, the, the process of uh, reflecting, refining, uh, identifying patterns. And the part that really appealed to me was the, the pause something that we don't seem to do enough of in our lives, to, to actually take out a break and stand still for a while. From there, um, I had the opportunity to spend some time in, in Japan, and uh, part of that involved uh, woofing and, and visiting different farms in completely different contexts of what I was used to. So <clears throat> for someone growing, uh, living at 54 degrees north, uh, seeing rice growing in the field was was quite a quite a novelty, and see way in the back there a small little Kubota tractor. The the, the use of small scale equipment in in small agricultural plots with a uh, Portuguese uh, other woofer. The two of us uh, on this dairy farm up in northern Hokkaido. I went from downtown Tokyo, where there was millions of people. And crowds to to a farm in Hokkaido where two cars an hour would maybe drive by in the road and spent some time becoming acquainted with some agriculture there and getting up at five in the morning to milk cows and visiting other locations such as a wasabi farm and some creative ways of dealing with growing in a river uh, difficult terrain and in this picture, you see a, uh, a single monorail cog system, which they use to move uh, in throughout that farm. Now, one of my uh, friends in Hokkaido took me to visit a fellow, and we went there and we basically visited. Most of it I didn't understand because my Japanese isn't that great. Um, and we had tea. And he had these solar panels tilted outside and kind of a, a pretty rudimentary couple of batteries and chargers. And my, my first impression was, well, this is, this is pretty hokey. Uh, what's, what's the big deal about this? But after reflecting for a while, um, and so he turned on his electric kettle and he, he made tea and, and, and served us. But the point he was making it was we sat there and enjoyed a cup of tea together from dispersed energy that was being gathered outside. It wasn't electricity coming from a nuclear power plant that's leaving waste and creating problems for generations to come. And and after reflecting on that, that was that was actually quite a quite a profound thing because it can be permaculture, um, sustainable efforts can be at at any kind of scale. And I ended up, ended up that trip doing a presentation at the Canadian Embassy. So from shoveling cow manure to 
wearing a suit at the embassy, I got the whole range of experience in Japan. Later on in the diploma program, um, Kim Chi and Dalvin were offering a, uh, a series of permaculture days uh, once a month for an extended period of time. I was able to join uh, one of those days, uh, meet a community of people um, on, uh, on Bowen Island, uh, but also uh, experience different teaching strategies. So the diploma, so I have, um, it's eight or maybe nine, I forget now, uh, projects that I've, I've written up in my final report on, on designs and, pro, and projects and events that I've, I've worked on. So there's the, what I call Rainbow Inn Harm, Farm, the, the home permaculture site. And, and here it is uh, built uh, in 2008. And I look at that picture now and not a weed in sight. Uh, planted, put those plants in the ground, and then jumped in the Volkswagen and headed down to Denman Island for the, the first permaculture course. And later, uh, with the, the Oregon State University course, uh, being able to go deeper into the design and begin to, to build on and expand uh, these concepts. The whole, the whole idea of identifying elements and creating linkages between, between them. So whether it's worm bins, greenhouses, uh, raised beds, compost piles, uh, creating a system, interconnecting all of it. So you can't see here, but these beds are actually sitting on top of, uh, of a roof, uh, below which is a root cellar. And uh, there's Andrea, one of the EcoTrust interns, uh, helping me plant uh, last summer. So this permaculture garden has sort of been my, my main teaching and inspiration for the, for the last uh, 10 years. And in uh, the winter of, of uh, 2020, I was thinking, you know what, I'm, I'm just producing way too much food. I'm spending all my time just giving it all away. Um, maybe I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to downsize a little bit because there's just, there's just way too much production. But my nature is, it's, it's not one thing just to talk about stuff. Uh, I feel like, you know, I, I, I want to show people uh, production, um, that these ideas are not just about, you know, a couple of plants uh, working together. Um, to me, pictures like this kind of make a, make a, make a bigger impact to the, to the average person, which is, is what I'm trying to do. But then COVID came along. Remember that? Uh, some two years ago, um, at work they keep reminding us now, I think it's been 700 days or something like that that we've been dealing with this. And so rather than reducing the garden, I decided to uh, expand the garden. And so I just took over the side of the road. I didn't ask permission. I just got the tractor out. Uh, gathered what, whatever resources I could find and built a garden. Uh, there were empty grocery stores, uh, people were panicking. Nobody really knew where the, where the whole thing was going to go. And huge challenges. And that's one of the challenges when you are trying to react to a crisis rather than put things in place. And so you can see um, this is, you can't really call this soil. Um, because I was going to scale down, I didn't buy any seed that year. I was just using my old seed. I could, you couldn't buy seed uh, in 2020. Um, and I also had uh, people call me up, concerned about food, looking to get seed from me, or how could we grow more food? Uh, what could we do? And you know, um, it was, it's actually, it, it was actually too late at that point. If we'd had really truly had a full scale crisis, uh, we wouldn't have been able to scale up uh, that fast because we didn't we didn't have the the people, uh, the inputs, uh, the land, uh, and the capacity to deal with that. And so 
I decided I would grow food and just take it to the food bank. And uh, in that first year, did a delivery. This picture is actually from uh, from last year. Uh, once a week, uh, producing about two thousand dollars retail value. And and then last year, I decided I would push this as, as much as possible, taking inspiration from, from market gardeners, uh, people like Cam, who's on the call, and managed to push that up to $7,000 value from this uh, little garden. Project number two is building on from transition towns. One of the, the projects we took on was a, a redevelopment of a two-acre site in within the city of Prince Rupert. And so, um, contacting uh, Mark, we um, we got together uh, and and did both the project, but also a training uh, session. So we got the experience uh, working, going through the process of doing community consultations, uh, getting buy-in, uh, doing all the the necessary stuff you have to do to get the the um, social license to go ahead with, with a project. And, and here we are at the end of the meeting, all sorts of ideas generated by members of the public, uh, pasted on a map of the site. Kind of the cream of it, uh, Mark and his team came to Prince Rupert. We did a public talk on placemaking at the Leicester Center and, and had 50 people in attendance in a, a two-day placemaking workshop. Uh, with many members of a uh, number of members from city council and city staff participating in this training session. And so um, one of my accomplishments in life, I can say, is introducing the word placemaking into uh, the lexicon and talk of Prince Rupert. How we can engineer uh, public space to create social outcomes. How you organize things has a social consequence. And uh, came up with multiple designs. Uh, we had another voting process and ended up with this final project, the, the final design um, drawn by uh, Mark's, uh, the city repair office. So, and, and shortly after completing that project, uh, we galvanized the community in an online voting the BCA play at home and won a hundred thousand dollar prize to build the playground portion of this park. So not only involving the community from all steps, but also in the the actual construction of the of the playground. <coughs> My third project is getting nothing to do with permaculture maps, but getting into sort of the political realm. And and trying to influence uh, the development of, 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 of policy at the, at the municipal level. And so the city of Prince Rupert launched a vision for Prince Rupert, uh, a modern vision, the, the Hayes 2.0. And part of this is one of these five is the 2030 Sustainable City Plan. And part of that uh, is a whole series of policies around uh, local food. We don't. We have an anti-animal bylaw. Um, we're we're a community not known for for agriculture uh, and, and those things, and so uh, we're starting from ground zero in comparison to to other communities. And and through that work uh, in 2018. Uh, the mayor and myself, we co-presented to city council the draft of the Sustainable City 2030 framework, for the overarching goals and policies. And finally, uh, this was adopted into the official community plan uh, last year. And, and so finally, uh, in the, the city planning documents, we have the sort of the aspirational goals of everything from urban farms to solar panels on houses, uh, the, all the kinds of infrastructure uh, re required. And so 
no other city plan to date has has included any part of that. And there's the public hearing here last April, just barely a year ago, uh, in, in which this plan was adopted. This is still a work in process because we still still don't have any uh, bylaws uh, developed around this. My fourth project is uh, being involved with, uh, as a college instructor, part of the, the, uh, the union and dealing with uh, uh, workers' capital. So the investment of our pension money in, in the province. And so uh, over the years I've been involved, I'm, I'm, I've been the chair of this advisory committee uh, for the past couple of years and playing a role on on uh, monitoring and, and, and making an impact on, on um, ESG or responsible investing. So in British Columbia, workers' capital, that's all those teachers and clerks and people who are contributing their money, uh, that's in a pooled fund of about $200 billion. And how that money is deployed and make a significant impact, whether it's climate concerns or low paid labors or maybe Amazon workers or uh, you, you name it. There's, there's a whole range of environmental, social and, and governance issues related to how companies operate around the world. And so this has been a, another long uh, process that uh, uh, to some extent has no end, is ongoing. Um, beginning some 10 years ago, co-presenting with, with uh, Michael Lewis, who wrote The Resilience Imperative, uh, the, the first talks that we had around responsible investing uh, quite a long time ago. And we now do a, every three years, do a, um, a detailed review of the investment uh, practices of the BC Investment Management Corporation. Now, it's, it's interesting working in this field because uh, you you begin to learn where you know where the push points are, um, how to operate in this environment, and then also the limitations. And I mean, frankly, it's quite something to be sitting in a room with other pension trustees and hearing people say, "We've only got three billion dollars, and we have absolutely no." Influence over our, over the people that invest our money, and that I mean three billion bucks is a fair bit of money if, in my books. But uh, if you have no control over that and how that's invested, uh, that's that's kind of concerning. Project number five: uh, developing the Sustainable Communities Associate Degree Program at Coast Mountain College. So. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. And so the idea is that uh, a series of courses developing leadership, organization, and communication skills with a grounding in uh, politics, uh, permaculture, um, different models of economic development, uh, that would be a great place for, for people to start out. And so this, uh, little graphic I made up in Word, because I'm not very good at this stuff, uh, tr trying to uh, integrate the permaculture principles into the overall goals of this uh, uh, program. So part of this involved getting permaculture uh, into the post-secondary education as a standard first-year science credit. It's the first in BC. Um, potentially a first in Canada. And permaculture does exist in continuing ed as a, as a kind of a fringe thing, or uh, a grad student may do a project on a related area, but it, to, so far it hasn't been just a standard course you can take as your, as your regular science credit instead of biology or chemistry or, or physics. And so that required working with the provincial articulation groups, uh, the relationships that you develop uh, with with the people around the province uh, over the over the many years of, of going to a lot of meetings. 
and his screenshot in the BC transfer grid right now of how, how this permaculture course uh, currently transfers around uh, British Columbia. And my hope is that uh, more institutions will pick up on this and uh, begin to uh, offer their own courses. So connected to that was actually delivering my first PDC together and in 2018. Uh, so happy to have Delvin before he went east to be able to come up and spend a week with me and uh, to co-teach that course. It was probably the, the, uh, the highlight of, uh, of my teaching career at the time. And we have Sherry on the call and there, there's a picture of her in the, uh, still, still on the website in the promotional uh, literature. And we spent uh, going around Prince Rupert, uh, visiting all sorts of locations. Uh, my friend Eric here demonstrating his, his little mini biochar operation, along with his, his uh, passion for growing fruit trees. Uh, back to the gardens, where my learning started, uh, seeing the successes and failures in, in action. In, in this particular climate zone, and then a tour up country to Hazleton and Smithers, uh, visiting all sorts of farms, eco villages, and alternative sites to to get a good uh, overview of, of everything. And we use the Guy Craft book as our as our textbook. Project number seven, so is sharing all this knowledge and learning. So trying to, to help others to, to adopt it. And so that one day uh, I'll just be uh, basically out of business. So my original career goal was to be like a district agriculturalist. And, uh, and I did my master's in extension education and your job as a technology extension transfer role is to basically put your out of, yourself out of business by helping people so much that they don't need your help anymore. So um, Ecotrust Canada has been running the, the North Coast Innovation Lab and uh, had a lot of success with uh, food security uh, initiatives, uh, partnering with, with uh, uh, MITAX um, research students, uh, bringing them in to do various uh, projects. And so <clears throat> the uh, project began in 2020, and uh, there's been quite a range of projects going on. Um, er everything from uh, looking at local seafood to uh, composting projects, uh, distribution networks, and uh, pictured here is Charles, who had the enviable job of uh, creating this urban farm uh, in downtown Prince Rupert, starting very late in the growing season and, and working with Charles to try and help him get a successful demonstration project, probably that started six months too late and get it up and running into something that looked really great uh, by, by midsummer. And so it was, it was quite, a, quite an undertaking. And uh, kudos to Charles for, for his efforts in doing that. And so basically taking all the, all the things I've learned and, and failed at and trying to uh, start from, not from zero, but from, you know, plus 10 years. The last project coming out of the COVID is doing a lot of public presentations around uh, food security. So, so taking, this is a presentation I actually started a number of years ago before COVID and the stores were empty. I've done it in Smithers, invited to the Terra City Council, um, online Ecotrust uh, City of Prince Rupert, and also a training session for the, the BC Institute of Agrologists. And to get people to think about uh, where their food comes from, uh, the, the supply chains, the, the corporate concentration, uh, how it actually all works and, and why such a globalized, centralized uh, system is incredibly fragile 
and it doesn't do any benefits to our, our, our economy as well. We're probably spending, there's 85,000 people here in the north, we're probably spending $400 a month each on food, and take in multiplier effects, and we're talking in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in terms of economic development that could be happening here by simply growing, producing, storing our, our food locally. So I'll wrap it up with this final slide. So my diploma program didn't involve a lot of uh, mapping of sites, uh, the sort of traditional, but it goes back to the permaculture efforts. So the fair share, earth care, people care. And so working in these, in this sort of political, more social uh, realm, while, while remaining grounded in my own garden, I've tried to make my little contribution um, a lot along these lines. And with that, thank you for for being here. That's end of my presentation. Happy to take any questions. Awesome, great work, Ken. Thank you so much. Super inspiring. Turn your mics on and jump in if you want to make a comment or ask a question. We'll have about 15 minutes together.